So, um, hi to everyone. Um, I appreciate your attention at this very difficult time of day. As Rick told me yesterday, this is uh, especially hard to talk in the afternoon. So, um, so I'm going to start be with telling you the subtext of what I'm going to be talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I'm going to start by telling you what is the subtext of what I'm going to be uh, talking about. The subtext of, of uh, my kind of very cursory notes about the case that uh, Professor Rachtel was presenting is that I think that he's a very, very good, uh, if not virtuosic, cognitive behavioral therapist. Okay, mostly so. Okay, and I'm going to try to make my case by, in, in, by making two points. Um, my first point is the importance of uh, conceptualization for uh, integrating of treatments. So uh, my first point is that actually every, before we begin to integrate treatments or interventions, what we should be thinking about and what we should start with is kind of a mini theory uh, which is a theory about a particular person, about the particular patients who come to treatment. And actually having such an integrative, comprehensive, et cetera, um, conceptualization or theory, we can start thinking about what do we need to integrate and how do we need to integrate and how it comes about, okay? And, and, and I want to tell a little story here about um, kind of comparing and contrasting it with architecture. Uh, I live on a side street of Rothschild Boulevard in the heart of the white city, okay? Um, and next to me, um, and, and I live in a building that was built in the 30s, and next to me is uh, uh, a building that uh, was built in like the 40s or something, I think. And there are tours, architectural tours, that stop in my street, okay? And the tours, and I always see them, they block my driveway, and um, there is a guide, and usually that's the end of the tour because the building next to me is this very famous Bauhaus building. And I always hear the guides um, talking about how great the building next to us is and how it's beautiful and form follows function and all these different things. And our building is really terrible because it's eclectic, okay? Uh, and it's really terrible eclectic uh, building with these big windows and European looking floors and it's all terrible. So I was really upset because I like my building. So I uh, interviewed one of my uh, architect friends and I asked him, well, what's wrong with our building? Why is the next building so wonderful and ours is so bad? And well, he said, well, of course, yours is eclectic. And I said, well, well what makes it eclectic? And he says, well, it's not like the other building. The other building has a very specific concept. Okay, it's built on this very unified theory of what a building should be, okay? And I didn't have a theory for your building, basically what he was saying. I can uh, articulate a theory for your building. So I, I took out of this exchange two lessons. One is that uh, if you like it, then it's integrative, and if you don't like it, it's eclectic. And the other <laughs> point is that, uh, that actually what makes something integrative if you, if you have a mini theory that explains kind of what you're doing, okay? And this is the point about uh, integration that I want to emphasize. And the other point that I want to make is, uh, as I was reading uh, the description of the case, was um, really the power of metaphors in treatment and uh, why metaphors matter and what kind of work they allow us to do um, in therapy. And, and, and in my way, in, in one sense, I believe they have really uh, an integrative force within the treatment. So these are the two main parts. Okay, so, um, so what's, what is a case conceptualization? Well, it's, it's kind of really a mini theory about a particular person who we are seeing. So it means it's ideographic, it's tailored to a particular person. And when it's really good, I think it's comprehensive. And by comprehensive, I mean that it takes into account, I'll start with the later part, that it takes into account that if a person has a problem, it's more than, it, it's not a disorder, it's a predicament. And I think predicament is a much better word because it's, it kind of um, evokes this ecosystem that the person is in. It's kind of this complex social, cultural um, existence that they're having outside um, the therapy room. And, and 
also for um, a conceptualization uh, to be good, I think it um, invites us to differentiate between two kinds of factors that are affecting the person's condition. What's, one set of factors are the factors that maintaining this condition. So, okay, so if I'm um, afraid of using the elevators, I'm afraid of or, or, or feel like I'm avoiding presenting in public, what maintains this avoidance or this anxiety? And the other factors are etiological factors. So the factors that brought into being the very vulnerability or the very sensitivity that allow this condition to develop in the first place. Now, I think that making this differentiation is one of the uh, theoretically uh, important contributions of cognitive behavioral therapy, I think. In, in this kind of thinking, we're invited to make this differentiation uh, very clearly. And um, the other um, direction or the other function of uh, case conceptualization is um, to be predictive, to be generative and predictive. What do, what do I mean by that? It means that, okay, if I understand what's going on, then the plan, how I'm going to do, go about it, should follow from my understanding. Not only the plan, okay, um, but also what are the kind of obstacles that I can encounter and that I might encounter in, in my moving forward, okay? So it's kind of like having a map of a new city or uh, a new place and knowing where the road long term might be, okay? So that's kind of uh, my image of this. So, um, so what should such a case consolidation look like? It's kind of loosely based on Jackie Parsons work so it would include the problems, okay, the problems that the person is having, um, the goals, the goals that they're having in, in, with relation to the problems, but not only with relation to the problems, kind of in general in life, the strengths and assets, um, the maintaining factors, the ethological factors, and the obstacle to treatment that I mentioned already. So if, if um, we take um, the example of John, I think you called him John in, in your writing, um, then his problem was his test anxiety, okay? But he also had another problem that began, became evident as treatment progressed was the excessive concern with social status, okay? Um, so actually one problem was very obvious at his, it was um, kind of, he presented us uh, with the problem uh, very explicitly, and the other became explicit in the first session. The goals were, were I think, uh, most immediately to pass the test, and in more generally is to assume an ability and the image consistent role. Okay, so the, these were kind of goals on different levels of abstraction. And he had multiple strengths and assets, he was bright, he had social capital, and so on, and this is kind of implied in the description. Now, um, here's a slide that I'm really anxious about because I'm, uh, as, as people in the audience know, I'm really um, not very well versed in uh, uh, Kahutian uh, uh, dialect. So I uh, got a lot of help from my friend Golan here. And whatever is right in the slide is, uh, of course, uh, attributed to me because I invited him and whatever is wrong, then it's Golan's fault. But let me try and... and, and <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> you should just grow a mustache, right? <laughs> so, um, so let me try this, okay? And and I think oh, my basic point here: if if one comes into trying to do one kind of intervention with a map that is not conducive to this kind of intervention, then one encounters problems in shifting gears or understanding what one needs to do first. So if I have a map of uh, the bicycle path in Tel Aviv, but I am actually taking a car, that's not going to be very helpful. I need to have a map and understanding that's conducive to the way I'm going to uh, go about. So if uh, I tried and I failed, so I turned to Golan. So Suppose my conceptualization is that this person has an absence of mirroring self-objects and therefore he has narcissistic vulnerability and rage when encountered with failure and therefore he has an avoidance of painful experience. Now, how do I go doing exposure therapy from here? I, I, I don't believe I really can. Start with the conceptualization, which I think is, could be 
um, understood in a different language and in somewhat differently. That's what I'm trying to do. We'll try to do in a moment. But uh, the conceptualization is not conducive to conducting a different kind of therapy. That's why um, uh, beginning with a conceptualization that's integrative, I think it's, um, it's really important for uh, integrative treatment. So, um, so what could uh, integrative uh, conceptualization look like? Well, one thing is kind of the rigid cognitions. I might, the person thinking, uh, and this is my image, um, I must look like a swarm uh, swan swimming upstream, kind of effortless. Right? I'm doing this effortless thing at all time. And I'm a special person, okay? And the, uh, the other maintaining factor is simply avoidance. So I have two, two factors that are maintaining um, my problem here. And the etiological factors, it's one salient one, there mu must be others, um, is the status conscience I'm bringing. And the obstacles to treatment, so I have a plan, I, I want to introduce exposure-based therapy with this person, My, I will encounter a problem because, uh, two problems actually, one of them is accepting being like others, okay, so my implementing exposure should feel to this person like we're doing something that is special in some sense and also common with other people in some sense. So this is, this is kind of the obstacle that we're foreseeing. Um, so what are our kind of ways of um, overcoming these problems is finding some way, and there are multiple ways of describing this process. It could be cognitive restructuring, it could be decentering and experiential exploration of rigid beliefs, which in a way uh, I believe was going on here, and uh, which the conclusion of which might be that I can be both like everybody and special. Okay, and if we can arrive at this uh, new stance, then it will be much easier to implement um, exposure therapy. Um, and we should be on the alert for um, angry and indignation, uh, anger and indignation about needing to do exposure. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't need to do exposure because I'm like a swan and it's supposed to be effortless. Okay, so that was the first part about um, conceptualization. Now, as you probably um, <coughs> saw and, and, and heard me, there were a lot of metaphors that I was using, and I, I kind of spontaneously found myself using those metaphors, and, and also the metaphor of the pan, uh, pan, panther uh, was very striking and beautiful to me. So I thought about the kinds of metaphors are used and why they're so effective. And I, I think there are several reasons why metaphors are, are such great vehicles in therapy. Um, the first one, um, and I'm not sure I'm listing them in the order of importance, but just in, a, in an associative way, is that it promotes a sense of intimacy with the patients by a creation of this kind of special R language, um, in it, as it was the case of the panther, was a language between you and, the, and John, and it was not really understandable to other people. Um, it allows us when the metaphor doesn't fit or does fit, we see the reaction in our patients. So it allows us to really check and see whether we entered their world correctly. And it promotes uh, flexibility. I think one of the best things about metaphor, one of the important things of metaphor, is um, relying on holding two concepts in mind simultaneously. So it promotes kind of flexible um, thinking. So uh, panthers are both powerful and respectful, and we can have the same, this image in our mind. Um, another, I think, um, thing that metaphors can do is promote mindfulness. Okay, and this is one of um, the favorite, my fav one of my favorite points uh, to promote uh, kind of experiential awareness and uh, invitation of different negative emotions that I think allows exposure to go on. It's a really beautiful poem I, I think you're reading in right now of a Persian poet from the 13th century. And the image is that um, negative emotions or any emotions are like guests that come to your house and then you entertain them for a while and, uh, and you, you sit with them for a while. And, and the poem continues and it's very beautiful, but Ilanit was waving at me, so I'll... Uh, I'll rush through the rest of my slides to continue to finish up. 
um, they promote insights. And, and here I'm drawing on really work from um, cognitive psychology of why metaphors are so helpful because they, they use, they take a domain about we know, uh, f about which we know a lot and they um, help us learn about a domain about which we know much less, okay? So for example, um, electric electricity is like fluid or anxiety is like a wave, okay? So wave is the domain about which we know more and so we can learn something about anxiety this way. Okay, um, I just, and then as I was preparing uh, this talk, I came across a really beautiful study that I just want to um, mention it because I think it's, it's, it's so powerful in explaining why metaphors uh, are so good. And it was a study about uh, metaphor, metaphors about grief. And they used in the study two kinds of metaphors about grief. One was, um, Grief, uh, as a time goes by, and I'm a passive uh, person looking at time going by, go, going by, or I go by, and then things change around me. And what they found in, in the study that the more active metaphor, the high agency metaphor, uh, affected the prediction of how long would it, be, uh, would it take for people to grieve. So in the active high potency, high agency metaphor, they, uh, they thought it would take five months to grieve over uh, a death of someone, and in the other metaphor, it took 10 months. So it was really striking to me that some, such a simple uh, manipulation can be so powerful. Um, so to wrap things up, um, integration of uh, metaphors into um, therapy will always be an art, okay? There's clear, clearly an uh, artistic component and coming up with apt metaphors will always range from masterful to virtuosic and we can only strive to be masterful and, uh, and be inspired by virtuosic performances. But uh, I think we need to think about the science of integration, of uh, reliance on mechanisms and on processes rather than uh, as we all uh, we've been talking here about brand names. And also, I think this um, talking about metaphor really illustrates that making integration into a science invites us to incorporate um, data from multiple domains, from social psychology, from cognitive psychology, and probably also from neurosciences. Thank you very much. Thank you.